Welcome one and all to the fourth installment of the, of the webinar Wednesday hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. My name is Scott McCullough with Vector Corrosion Technologies, and I'm honored to serve again as host for today's program. Every month when we kick off webinar Wednesday, I am always amazed by the diversity of the audience tuning in. Today, we have guests joining us from Mexico to Malaysia and Singapore to Saudi Arabia. Welcome one and all. Webinar Wednesday is a series of monthly educational webinars running from August 2020 to July 2021, addressing best practices and new innovations in the field of bridge preservation. Upcoming webinars include such exciting topics as non-destructive testing, impressed current cathodic protection, post-tension evaluation, and even trenchless culvert rehabilitation. Before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge that today is November 11th, Remembrance Day, or as our friends in the United States say, Veterans Day. Today is the day we remember the sacrifices of those brave souls who came before us, who laid the foundation for the world and the freedoms we now enjoy. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. The Concrete Preservation Alliance remembers. The Concrete Preservation Alliance is a growing coalition of organizations committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete pre pre preservation and infrastructure renewal. And as you can see, our membership has tripled since our last webinar Wednesday. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Credence, Fortius, Deor, Protector, WKENC, SCP, FOSROC, and IEC to the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Our members are concrete evaluation, repair, and protection specialists and are dedicated to saving structures and sustainable thinking in construction. If you're interested in more information about the Concrete Preservation Alliance or the upcoming Webinar Wednesday program, I encourage you to visit wesavestructures.info. All upcoming webinars and events will be posted on the events tab seen here. And just as a reminder, today's live webinar will be recorded and posted here for your benefit later. Enough preamble though, it's time to introduce our featured speaker. Let's welcome the talented Mr. Mr. Chodacek from Vector Corrosion Technologies. Jason is a Marine Specialist and a NACE Certified Cathodic Protection Technician. When Jason was a young fella, he received his associate's degree in computer, computer engineering. Then, clearly because computer engineering was just not challenging enough for him, <laughs> he pivoted into a remarkable career in the field of concrete repair and infrastructure renewal. Jason has over 25 years experience in restoration and protection of reinforced concrete structures and has worked extensively in the areas of corrosion of reinforcing steel, cathodic protection, concrete assessments, and concrete repair. While Jason grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, he now calls Melbourne, Florida his home with his wife and two boys. Today, Jason is here to share his wealth of experience and with extending the service life of existing structures and uh, existing concrete piles and steel piles in fresh, brackish, and saltwater environments. You can see Jason hard at work here with his trusty core drill. And just before I pass it off to Jason, uh, if you have a question uh, that you'd like addressed, please submit it in advance of the, uh, sorry, in the uh, Q&A uh, function on the menu to your right. Uh, we'll do our level best to get through uh, all the questions at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Jason. Take it away. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Just want to make sure, can you hear me? Okay, we're good to go. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, the presentation outline. And uh, there's a few of these things that I'm going to talk about here today. I'm going to briefly just uh, uh, touch on corrosion and corrosion in concrete and uh, basically what happens or why corrosion actually occurs in, in concrete. Um, then I'm going to move on to uh, exposure conditions, uh, basically all the different types of conditions that a marine structure is exposed to. And then we're going to talk about some of the different types of CP jackets or cathodic protection jackets that are used uh, for these marine piles and uh, it's going to be everything from steel to reinforced concrete uh, that we're going to talk about as well. 
then I'm going to do a little comparison of the different types of cathodic protection jackets that are available or that I uh, talk about. And then uh, we're going to show some typical installations of some of these types of systems and just go through some examples. And then to finish it off, we're going to talk briefly uh, about steel pile or story, or sorry, steel sheet piling and some of the different uh, cathodic protection options available for uh, sheet piling and the different environments that it's exposed to as well. So uh, I'm going to start off here with uh, why does steel corrode? When you put, uh, um, when you have steel, we bring it out of the ground as an iron ore and what we end up doing is we end up uh, producing uh, steel out of this iron ore and what we're doing is we're pushing a lot of energy into it. We're really elevating the energy level of this iron ore and we're bringing it up to steel. So we've pushed a huge amount of energy into this iron ore and all that it wants to do is go back to what it naturally was. So in turn it wants to go back to rust. Um, so we push all of this energy into it and now it just wants to go back to its natural state. Um, concrete. I'm sure most people in here are very familiar with concrete, so it's uh, very high in pH. Um, it's highly alkaline. Um, it's also hard, but it's also very porous. So because it's porous, it can absorb all sorts of liquids and is also porous to uh, um, other contaminants and so forth. Um, it's great in compression but it's also poor in tension and this is exactly why we have to uh, uh, embed steel into the uh, into the structure as well and uh, this is exactly why it requires re uh, reinforcement so now that we know that we need reinforcement or reinforcing steel within our concrete what happens to this reinforcing steel when you embed it in a high pH environment so a good quality concrete actually produces, uh, they call it a passive oxide layer. And this passive oxide layer surrounds our reinforcing steel. So it's a very, very thin film, but it's a protective film. And uh, this is formed naturally in concrete when you take reinforcing steel and embed it in a high quality, uh, a high quality, high pH concrete. And what will end up happening is over time, this passive oxide film is going to break down. And there's two main disruptors to this uh, breakdown of this passive oxide film. And one is carbon dioxide. And then the most common one is chloride. So once chlorides penetrate your uh, concrete, it gets to your reinforcing steel level and it breaks down this passive oxide layer. And then what can result is, of course, the corrosion or the rusting of your reinforcing steel. So what are the main sources of corrosion or corrosion of reinforcing steel? For the most part, um, chl uh, chlorides are the, the, the number one disruptor to uh, uh, this passive oxide layer and the number one cause of corrosion of reinforcing steel and even sheet piling. Um, there are a number of other sources of chlorides, um, but I'm going to be mainly focusing here on the marine environment. So we're just going to be talking about seawater. And one thing to note is that in this process, the chlorides are never consumed in this process. So throughout this chemical reaction, the salt or the chlorides always remain there for future corrosion. Uh, here's just a couple of photos of some of the concrete reinforced piles that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, you can see here in our tidal zone area here where it's very aggressive and it can even reach up higher outside of the tidal zone into a splash zone area. And you can even see here along the tops that some of these concrete caps have also been exposed um, to the uh, chlorides and, and are heavily, heavily damaged here as well. So on the next few slides here, I'm going to go through a history of, of pile protection. So I'm going to start up at basically the very beginning and move our way into some of the uh, cathodic protection systems that are available. Um, so originally, um, what they would do is they would install an oversized fabric or a, a FRP or a fiberglass reinforced polymer form. And what you would do is you would place these forms around the pile. And in this example here, we just actually have a canvas bag and it's secured at the bottom and it has a zipper on it. So I don't know if you can see in the picture here, there's a zipper. So they zipped it up, they place this canvas bag around the pile, they secure it to the top 
and then they just pump grout into it. They pump concrete into it. So it's like a mass filled uh, uh, concrete jacket and they're just trying to provide cover um, to, to prevent more chlorides from penetrating to the pile. And then what happens is with this with this concrete jacket or with this fabric jacket is you end up trapping, you still end up trapping the chlorides in behind this, this uh, uh, fabric bag and corrosion can still occur. So it makes visual inspection very difficult. So there's obviously corrosion that's gonna continue on behind this pile, there's gonna be cracking and distress, but because you have this large, this large uh, fabric bag around it, it makes it very, very difficult to see any uh, new damage that's going to be occurring. Another, uh, another uh, type of a jacket system that was also used to try to control or, or uh, control the corrosion in these piles was uh, an epoxy filled uh, fiberglass jacket as well. And essentially it works very, very similar. You take a fiberglass form, you place it around your, your concrete pile here and you fill it with epoxy grout. And this is actually a recent picture that I just took a few months ago. And one thing to note is, is that even though uh, this jacket has been put around it, it's gonna reduce the oxygen somewhat and some of the moisture levels, corrosion can still uh, continue underneath. And you can see how the corrosion uh, kept, uh, kept growing and growing and growing. And you can actually see that all of the reinforcement within this pile is basically completely gone. And now when we were looking at this pile with the jacket on it, you couldn't see any of this distress. Um, so during the installation of a new cathodic protection system, a new cathodic protection jacket, it was just decided that they were going to remove these jackets so that they could visually inspect it. So what happened was in the 90s, it was documented that uh, these types of jacketing systems, the uh, mass filled concrete jackets and the uh, epoxy filled jackets, basically were just concealing the corrosion that was occurring um, underneath of these jacket systems and they weren't controlling any of the uh, any of the uh, corrosion that was actually continuing and so in 1998 uh, the Florida Department of Transportation so that's the state I obviously live in here they actually uh, concluded that the only jacketing that was allowed within the state was jacketing that had cathodic protection incorporated into the jacket itself. Um, similarly, in 99, uh, the Virginia uh, Transportation Research Council also found um, during their studies a very similar, uh, a similar conclusion. And also all of their jackets had to be supplemented with, uh, with some sort of cathartic protection system. So over here on the right side of the picture, you can see here, this was a, a, an epoxy jacket and here was a standard concrete uh, fiberglass jacket. And you can see how the corrosion continued to occur. And by the time that you start to see this visual damage through the jackets, there's been a lot of corrosion and there's been a lot of damage that's been done to this structure. So now I'm going to go through and talk about the exposure conditions that the piles that uh, these uh, reinforced concrete piles are exposed to and uh, and then I'll dive into some of the, the solutions or some of the cathartic protection jacket systems that are available for it. So the first area that I'm going to talk about is this submerged section down here. So this is everything that is in the water that is constantly submerged in the water and this uh, this section here within the water one thing to note is, is that there's not a lot of oxygen that's available. So there's a little uh, limited amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water, but for the most part, there's not a, uh, it's not a, a huge amount of corrosion that's occurring down here. It's not extremely aggressive. It can, um, it can occur down here, but it becomes much, much more aggressive once you get up into this tidal zone. So everybody's familiar with tides. So tides move with the, you know, with the rotation of the earth and the moon. And what ends up happening is this water level, the water level rises, rises and lowers over time. And so this section of the pile is constantly wetted and constantly exposed to oxygen. So this is a very, very aggressive environment for corrosion. The next area that I'm going to talk about is the splash zone. So this is very similar to the tidal zone. The only difference being is, is that this is, is more periodically wetted. Um, so storm events, wind, uh, could be boat traffic. But this area up here 
gets wet quite often and is exposed to a lot of oxygen, obviously. And uh, and this area here basically is a similar corrosion point as as to the tidal zone. So these areas here can become very, very aggressive. And this is typically where you're going to see all of your problems um, within a, within a marine structure, or within marine pilings. The last zone that I'm going to talk about is this zone that's much, much higher up on the pilings or on the structure. Um, so we call this the atmospheric zone. So you typically think of it as being a dry zone. So in some storm events, you can get some wetting up here. Um, you can get some splashing up here, but typically this is from chlorides um, that are actually chlorides that if you go, to, for example, if you go to a beach or you go to an area where there's any sort of waves that are crashing, you'll see a salt mist. And this salt mist is basically carried through the air and then applied or deposited to these uh, higher portions on these piles. So this area here, once it, once, it, uh, once it receives enough chlorides and enough wetting, eventually these chlorides get into the uh, depth of uh, reinforcement and now can cause corrosion as well. So this area here typically is not as aggressive as the areas down here, but again, one thing to note with all of these conditions, whether you're in the submerged zone all the way up to this atmospheric zone, is that all of these conditions can cause corrosion. Um, obviously, the, the middle two ones are a little bit more aggressive. And uh, so now what I'm going to move on to is I'm going to talk about um, a galvanic cell, a galvanic cell and how, how we're going to use this galvanic cell to basically provide or or provide cathodic protection to these uh, marine piles. And so if we all uh, can go back to kind of our school days is uh, I think we've all seen this, this galvanic cell previously. So what we have is we have an electrolyte. So here it could be a glass of water, could be a glass of salt water. So we have our electrolyte, we're going to place an anode in it, could be a piece of steel and then, or sorry, a piece of zinc. And then we're going to have our cathode which could be a piece of steel and we're going to have our uh, metallic path. Now that we have our metallic path, we have our electrolytes, so ions, we have our ionic current that's flowing down here, but we also are, have our electric path. And now basically what we've done is we've created uh, a galvanic cell and what's going to end up happening is our anode is going to sacrifice itself, release electrons, corrode while protecting the cathode. So we can do the same thing with a marine structure with uh, reinforced uh, with reinforced concrete structures. So over here on the right, for example, I have our cathode or our steel. We also have our anode or our zinc and we have our metallic path, which is our wire connecting the two together. And then it is submerged in salt water, just like our galvanic cell over on the on the left side. So now we have an electrolyte, we have our anode, our reinforcing steel, which is our cathode, and our, uh, elect our metallic path. So we now have a completed galvanic cell here as well. And what will end up happening is our zinc is going to corrode in preference to our reinforcing steel and protect it. So why do we use zinc? Um, use zinc in a marine environment? Well, zinc is actually activated by salt water. So we want to keep zinc oxidizing. So when reinforcing steel corrodes or rusts, it's oxidizing and it's releasing electrons. So we want zinc to remain active while we have it in this environment here in a, in a marine environment or a salt water environment. We want this zinc to continue to corrode or oxidize throughout this process. And so that's one thing to note is that zinc is a very, very, or sorry, uh, salt is a very good oxidizer and it's going to keep this zinc basically producing current, protecting our reinforcing steel um, within our pile. So now I'm going to go in and talk about some of the different systems that are available for our submerged zone and our tile zone. Um, the next system that I'm going to talk about is combining, basically it's one system that can protect our submerged zone and our tidal zone. So if you see here in the picture here, we're going to have our water or our submerged zone, all our pile below the water line, and then we have this tidal zone. So you can see where the water has, has uh, rises, rises and lowers every day. So the 
the jacketing system or the cathodic pr protection jacketing system that I talk about here is, is a zinc mesh jacket. And essentially what it consists of is a zinc mesh that is placed around a pile inside of a fiberglass form or a stay in place fiberglass form. So this zinc mesh is typically attached to this fiberglass form. It is placed around, uh, around a concrete pile. It can be square or it can be round. And at the bottom of this jacket system, we place a bulk zinc anode. So it's just a mass bulk zinc anode. So what happens is this zinc mesh is for the tidal zone protection and the bulk zinc anode is for the submerged zone. And here are some of the system components here. So here is the zinc mesh, the zinc mesh that is pre-installed pre, uh, to our fiberglass shells or our fiberglass stay in place form. One thing to note is, is that these can be square or they can be round. They come in a variety of different shapes. Um, essentially, you go out and uh, the contractor will field measure the piles beforehand to ensure that they're uh, ordering the correct size of a jacket and then these uh, fiberglass jackets are custom manufactured um, to size. And so regardless whether it's a round, a round fiberglass uh, jacket or a square one, they're typically come, they typically come in two halves with a tongue and groove. If you look here, you can see that there's a tongue and groove here and one here, and they're basically just placed together. There's two C's that are placed together to close the jacket up. Typically, there's an epoxy. There's some stainless steel screws that go in here and some epoxy to help seal this tongue and groove joint. Um, so, and you can see here on the bottom, uh, the bottom of this jacket, or actually it's the top, the way it's flipped around, is uh, this is uh, the anode wire or the mesh wire that is going to be uh, routed up to our junction box here. Um, so not all, not all cathodic protection jackets have junction boxes. Uh, some do, and it just really depends upon uh, whether or not a uh, cathodic protection jacket wants to be monitored to see what type of performance and life cycle um, you're going to get out of it. So the, these wires are run up through into the junction box and connected to the appropriate terminals. And again, on the underside of this jacket, you have a mass bulk zinc anode. Again, wires attached to it. It's also run up to the junction box here as well. And again, that bulk anode is just for the submerged zone. So now you can see that I've been talking about some of these uh, these anode wires. So we have our anode wire coming off of our zinc mesh. We have our anode wire coming from our bulk anode and they come into this junction box. And so if you come and look at it, we have an anode terminal on here and we also have our structure terminal on here. And so what is this structure terminal used for? Well, that structure terminal is going to be used to connect all of our reinforcing steel to it. So typically what is done and there's a variety of different methods for it but this is going to be the most common method is we have our reinforced concrete pile and within it we have our reinforcing steel so for example here we're using some pre-stressed strands um, with a spiral tie um, wrapped around it so uh, this can also apply to uh, conventional reinforced piles as well but essentially what you're going to do is you're going to come in and you're going to cut a concrete groove out of this pile. You could also drill holes, um, but as I said, it's more common to do it this way. You're going to expose the reinforcing steel, and once you have this reinforcing steel exposed, you're going to want to come in and measure or measure the continuity and make sure that all of this reinforcing steel is continuous. We want to make sure that all of this reinforcing steel is touching each other, because if there's one strand or one bar, that is not continuous or, or touching each other within this structure, it will not be protected. Then what you'll do is you're gonna end up making a connection, a couple of different connections for a redundancy to your reinforcing steel, and you will then run this cathode wire up to your junction box that I showed you in the previous picture. So here's just a, a couple pictures of the installation of some of these typical mesh jackets. And uh, so we have here is we have our mesh jacket, fiberglass, the diver here uh, has taken this, this jacket, placed it up around the pile. He's just securing it right now so that he can put his stainless steel screws in with the epoxy to seal the jacket up. And you can see some of the bracing that he has here on his float. 
So once he has the jacket secured and in place and all the wiring completed, you can see over here, there's a mock-up of the strong backs or the bracing that is used to to keep the shape of the uh, cathodic protection jacket or of the fiberglass jacket, especially these square jackets. Uh, you don't want these square jackets bulging out in the center um, while you pump the jacket. And you can see the strong backs here are placed around the fiberglass jacket and secured in place. And then it is poured, uh, pumped back. And so there's a number of different ways that you can fill these jackets as well, which I'll go through um, at a later slide. So here are just a number of the jackets that are finished. Um, so you can see all the jackets are pumped, just finished being pumped. They're going to need to be cleaned. Typically, they come in and pressure wash any of the concrete that was spilled over the top. And you can see these ones here all have junction boxes. So all of the wiring from the zinc mesh comes up through the conduit to the junction box. And then there as well, from your reinforcing steel, there's the wire, the cathode wire that comes up through your uh, conduit into your junction box and then all the connections are made there. So um, basically what can happen in the future is you can come back, open these junction box up and actually take current measurements and potential measurements and calculate how much life is left within your or for your cathodic protection jacket. So um, these next few slides here are showing you how how this cathodic protection jacket works or how this zinc mesh jacket works. So again, we have our wet zone or our submerged zone. So we have our bulk anode here. So this bulk anode um, is embedded in seawater or a very good electrolyte. So this bulk anode passes current through the electrolyte and is basically protecting the entire submerged zone of this pile. Now, as you start to move up the pile, we get into our jacketed zone, and this is where we have our zinc mesh. So through the tidal fluctuation, we end up having the water that is going to wick up or it's going to enter the bottom of the jacket system and through the tidal action, uh, move up and down within the limits of this jacket. And one thing to note is that within this jacket, um, you're going to get this water movement essentially where the tidal fluctuation is. So as you start to get up a little bit higher into the drier zone, you're gonna have less and less seawater available or less salt water available. So this area here is going to tend to not to get as much current as the area down below that is immersed in the seawater at all times. Um, so this brings me into some of the improvements that, uh, that have been made to the, to the tidal jacket or to the zinc mesh jacket. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we get really, really good protection um, within, within our tidal zone area. So we have lots of seawater that's available. It encases or encapsulates the entire or the bottom portion of our zinc mesh. And uh, as I talked about in our previous slides, the zinc mesh is activated by the seawater. But as we move further and further up on the pile, we end up getting into this drier zone. So these drier zones, um, obviously there's limited availability to seawater and without this seawater as an oxidizer, our zinc starts to passivate. And if you look over here at our corrosion rate, um, <clears throat> the corrosion rate chart, we can see the zinc, uh, basically the corrosion rate or how much current zinc produces versus pH. So if you look at concrete, concrete's, <clears throat> concrete's typically going to be in this range here, older concrete on a, on a marine structure. And if you look at it, zinc is going to passivate within this range. So that's what we have happening. As, as we get higher and higher up in these elevations, we do not have any seawater available. So within this area, our zinc is passivating or basically it's not producing any current. So these higher up areas, are very, very limited um, to the amount of current that a jacket, that a, a standard mesh jacket can receive. So this brings me into the next area that I'm gonna talk about. Um, so we've talked about that tidal and the submerged zone. So now what about this splash zone, what I, what, which I just mentioned. So we have this splash zone that's up here that is periodically being wetted, has a lot of chlorides, a lot of oxygen. So how can we take a mesh jacket 
and how can we increase this performance of this mesh jacket? What can we do to this jacket to help it produce more current in these drier zones? Well, there's a few different things that we can do. Um, we can increase um, the zinc exposure to the seawater. So essentially uh, make sure that it's immersed or, or encapsulated in seawater, increasing the wet zone. <clears throat> so as the wet zones increased or as more and more of the zinc is exposed to seawater, we're gonna get a, an increase in oxidization of the zinc. And so we're gonna get an increase in current from our from our zinc as well. So with all of that, you're just going to get increased performance. So this zinc up in the higher portions of your jacket are going to be utilized much, much more. So this brings me into the next type of a jacket system. So we uh, call this a Tidal Plus jacket. Um, so some of the this is basically adding some of the benefits that we have to a mesh jacket to our Tidal to a Tidal Plus jacket. So again, this is for the Tidal and the Splash Zone and submerged portions. So the way that the system components function is, is we have our anodes that are attached to our pile. They are, they're bulk, or sort of they're bulk zinc anodes that are essentially attached to our pile, but they're encased in a wicking fabric. And you'll note at the bottom, this wicking fabric tail extends out the bottom of the jacket. And so this wicking fabric or this wicking tail at the bottom allows salt water in the bottom of the form and allows the salt water to wick all the way up this fabric and encase or encase and make sure that this entire anode that we have in here is encased or um, surrounded with seawater so that this anode will always remain in an active state. So we don't have portions, you know, our bottom portions down here are not wet and these portions are dry. The entire portion of this anode is actually wetted from that capillary action that's taking place. Again, we have a bulk anode down here to take care of the submerged sections and we have a stay in place form. Um, one thing to note is the stay in place form can be a PVC stay in place form or a fiberglass form as well. So this type of a system here, because we have constant wetting of the anode throughout the entire jacket system, we end up getting an increased performance um, with the system. So again, bulk anode, we have our stay in place jacket, and here is the wicking anode. So it's basically a solid zinc anode. You can almost think of it like a bulk anode that is in, that is basically placed inside of a wicking uh, wicking fabric sleeve. So it allows the salt water to move up of this sleeve and have salt water continuously wetting this entire anode. So here again, is just a, a depiction of how the system works. So we have our wicking tails that are extending out the bottom of the jacket. And if you look over here on the right, this is our wet zone. So we have our wicking tail, the water actually uh, works its way up this wicking fabric and encompasses the entire anode within that fabric. So we end up getting very, very good wetting. We end up getting a lot more current out of it um, because of this increased capillary action. And we're not just relying on the tidal flow or tidal surge here to bring the water up and down the jacket. We're actually getting this capillary action and really um, dramatically increasing the amount of anode exposure to our seawater. So now all of this anode that's exposed to the seawater is now oxidizing or producing current, and now we're able to protect an area much, much higher up out of the water as compared to uh, the mesh jacket. So this is how it works. Um, the, the wicking anodes are made of a zinc anode, there's a zinc anode inside. It's a solid cast core on the inside. There are tie wires that are cast through this solid core. So as the zinc is consumed, obviously it's going to be consumed and oxidizing from the outside in. So as it's being consumed, our electrical connection or our metallic path from our anode to our steel is always remaining a good connection. The other thing that happens is we have that wicking fabric that surrounds, uh, completely surrounds our anode and uh, 
all, and allows the uh, seawater to basically flow around or encompass this entire anode. And then the other thing that I'd mentioned previously was that concrete will passivate zinc um, because of the uh, the pH. You know, when concrete is down here at a pH of, you know, 10, 11, 12, when zinc is in contact with concrete that is in this zone, um, zinc will start to passivate. So not only does this wicking fabric help saturate the entire zinc anode, but it also acts as a protective barrier between the zinc and the concrete. So we don't actually have any passivation um, from the uh, uh, passivation of the anode um, due to contact with the concrete. So, so what do these improvements mean? So we have uh, our original mesh jacket. We have the tidal jacket now. Um, what are these improvements? What do they do? So a tidal jacket, when you um, install a tidal jacket, you get a standard zinc density. So we typically refer to it as you get 1.6 pounds of zinc per square foot of jacket um, or 6.7 kilograms per square meter. Um, it's a one size fits all. So you have whether your pile is 18 inches in diameter or 40 inches in diameter, this is the type of jacket. Um, you have one density of zinc that you're going to use for, for your pile. Um, with the Tile Plus, with um, having them made with discrete anodes, what we have is we have the ability to increase the amount of zinc within the cathodic protection jacket. So in this first example here, we have four anodes, one to each face. In the second anode, we have essentially doubled the amount of zinc on this pile with two anodes per face. So increasing the amount of zinc obviously increases the volume, so it increases the uh, life cycle or the life uh, life design of, of a cathodic protection jacket. So here, the, the Title Plus jacket, the design is actually based upon the service life requirements. So do you want a 20 year service life for the CP jacket? Do you want a 30 year service life? So that's what's gonna dictate how this type of a system, the Tidal Plus system, is uh, is uh, designed. So now I'm just going to move into uh, uh, some examples of the Tidal Plus jacket being installed. So you can see here we have our our uh, PVC forms, and they will ship flat regardless whether you have a round pile or a square pile, or you're making a round jacket or a square jacket. Um, it'll ship flat, so it takes up a lot less room and uh, there's basically a zip tool so you place the whoops i'll go back you place the zip you place the uh the pvc form around around the the uh, pile that you're trying to protect and there's a zip tool that will just basically close this jacket up as well so there's no epoxy or screws that are required for this you can also see in this jacket here that these the wicking anodes here have been applied or attached to the pile Again, there's all your cathode and anode connections that need to be made. There's actually a junction box up here on the opposite side of this pile where all of the connections are being made. So then again, you're going to use some sort of strong backs or forming. You want to make sure that the jacket stays centered and uh, isn't deformed during the pumping process. And then it is filled with grout. So if you look over here, these piles or these jackets were just filled with grout. You can see the wires hanging out on the opposite sides here um, where they have been routed up through the junction box and uh, and now they're going to come back put a chamfer on the top and uh, finish energizing these cp jackets so now i'm going to move into the atmospheric uh, zone so i talked about the zones below that are basically wet um, or periodically wetted or submerged so this atmospheric zone, as I mentioned previously, obviously there's very limited uh, moisture up here. We cannot rely on seawater, um, as I had mentioned. So up in this top area, we don't have seawater. So the seawater is, uh, is not present to help us activate or oxidize any of the zinc that is gonna be used up in this area. So what we're gonna do is instead of relying on salt, so on all of the previous examples, we relied on the salt or the seawater to oxidize our zinc to produce current. And uh, so what we're going to do here is 
where if you look at the table for the corrosion rate of zinc versus pH, so zinc is active in a lower pH range or a higher pH range. Well, steel is also protected in the higher pH range as well. Steel will not corrode. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an environment of high pH so that it is it oxidizes our zinc but also at the same time is protective to our reinforcing steel. We could use a lower pH down here as well, but it would be aggressive to our reinforcing steel or oxidize our reinforcing steel and the zinc at the same time. So it's going to be much more beneficial to use a higher pH um, system here to activate our zinc or keep it in an active state. So it's very similar. Um, this is a DAS or a distributed anode system jacket. It's a very, it looks very similar to some of the Tidal Plus systems. And uh, I'm going to try to fix my camera. I just know my camera. Let's see. There we go. Uh, so what we have is we have a jacket system that has a junction box. Is salt water is not required. We would not need salt water to have this jacket function. These jackets can be placed in salt water. So if you have a pile that is distressed down below the tidal zone, and you can pull the man from the atmosphere without uh, reaching the pile, you can use this type of jacket. But what we have is we have an anode. Instead of an anode that's encased in a thickening fabric, it actually very high alkaline and it does is it keep that zinc very very active safe and stable. Um, we also put a stay in place form around the pile uh, and we'll fill this this stay in place form. Um, one thing to note is that these jackets can be used in salt water, brackish water, fresh water and all types of dry land. are extending this jacket down to the water of your zone. Again. So I'm going to move into another structure where this jacket, this type of a jacket was installed with the self-impact wave jacket system. This is actually a project for UP. Um, this is actually an intercoastal waterway here. So this bridge spans the intercoastal waterway. See the columns here, these are fairly large columns, and uh, there were 40, basically there were 40 columns, and all of these columns were in the atmosphere. So originally, this column had a standard concrete jacket that was placed around it. And you can see where the height of the standard concrete jacket came up. Again, this wasn't controlling the corrosion or stopping the corrosion, so the jacket was removed. And you See the jacket was removed from the corrosion that was occurring underneath, so all of the delaminated concrete was removed. You can see a continuity groove was created here, there's one in the back column here as well. So they're checking all the steel to make sure all the steel is continuous. They want to make sure that there's no touching, that when we do connect the protection jacket, all of the steel. It's uh, then cleaned, continuity is all checked, and then what we do is, is you're going to move on to the, the jacketing portion. So here you can see the activated or the alkali activated anodes have been reinstalled inside of the jacket. So there's all the wiring that is on the top of it here at the top. But all the anodes, the alkali activated anodes, have been reinstalled inside of this fiber. Not better. Okay. Nobody wants to see me. Um, so what we have is uh, now we have placed the uh, we have now placed the 
the DAS, the alpha activated jacket system around the column. You can see that there's pumping port within this fiberglass jacket. It's uh, braced so that it's going to remain or keep its shape throughout the process. And then it's just simply pumped. You can see they have their concrete hose here and they hook it up with all the different ports along the jacket to pump it in. So this is what the finished product looks like. So you can see here all the jackets are installed, you see the pumping port, and you can see the junction boxes on the top. This is where all the anode wires come up, the activated anode and all of the uh, cathodic wires from the reinforcing system. There was a uh, typically there's a 45 degree chamfer that's also applied to it, and then the cathodic protection specialist will come in and actually uh, energize. They call it energizing the jacket system or connect the uh, connect the system up. So this is uh, just a summary of uh, of some of the of the jacket systems that I spoke about here. Um, so it's going through the through the uh, title jacket all the way up through to the DAS jacket. And you can see where these jackets are affected. So if you're ever looking for a jacketing system and you're trying to figure out which one you should use for what location, um, this is just a good reference. Point. Okay. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, I just have a quick slide on this is pumping. So some of your pumping options. So um, there's a couple of different options that uh, contractors have. So a new, a new um, way of pumping the jacket that's just been developed is what we call the integrated pumping. So what these are is there's tubes that go down opposite sides of the jacket. There's two tubes in there. Um, some of you may be familiar with manchette tubes, so it functions very similar to that. So in this example here, we have an eight-foot jacket. So there's actually ports within this pumping tube that automatically blow out as the grout starts to rise, creates pressure within the jacket and then communicates to the valve, essentially. So it allows the grout to flow down to the bottom of the jacket and not to the top. Uh, the traditional or more standard way is you have your concrete truck, you have your concrete pump, you have your hose, and you send a diver down to the hose to connect all the different of the jacket. Typically, they're staying about three feet or so. And so the diver will pump the bottom port. Once the grout comes out four feet up, they can go from the top to back. So the final section that I'm going to talk about here is uh, is sheet piles. How do you protect sheet piles that is in this type of pumping environment? So here we obviously have some uncoated sheet pile. You can see code and on the right side here we have a coated sheet pile so even when you have sheet piling that is coated um eventually over time this coating breaks down obviously the sea water um get in the salt water can get in and start to attack our uh, standard steel and the coating obviously gets first So, so what can we do? You know, we have, for example, this, this uh, picture here. We have an uncoated sheet pile that is embedded in the seam. Um, so what do we have here? Very similar to what um, we have when we have a concrete pile in, in a pumping environment. So we have three zones here. We have our atmospheric zone again. We have our tidal zone, and we have and our submerged zone obviously has a lot of availability of seawater, very little oxygen. So it's not a massive amount. This is not a really, really aggressive uh, location for erosion to occur down here. But because of the seawater, it makes it actually very, very easy uh, to provide cathodic protection. So we will end up using the seawater to our benefit to help provide cathodic protection. Seawater is also a really good electrolyte, so that's also pretty good. So what we'll do for the submerged section is, is we can just take some bulk aluminum anode and weld
smell them. These aluminum atoms are electrically connected to the sheet pile wall. And as they're connected and submerged in this salt water, they're going to oxidize and basically release electrons. And it's going to protect everything within this submerged zone. So very similar to that volcano that we have on our concrete slab, it's going to protect everything within the submerged zone. Now it's going to depend on whether you have an uncoated sheet pile wall, whether you have just some holidays in a sheet pile coating. Um, so the more host you have, the more atoms. So what do we do with this atmosphere for this tidal zone? Uh, so as mentioned before, these zones we have a lot of moisture, um, a lot of splashing, a lot of availability of oxygen. So the areas here very, very aggressive. This makes it very one of the options that are available is similar to a jacking plant. What you can do, you can come in and attach activated anodes within this section. So now we come in and we attach these activated anodes. One thing to note is that when we attach an anode to this, it's not embedded in an electric ring at the moment. It's being exposed to air, and the air is not very effective. So it has to do something to encase the anode. So what we can do is we can add concrete capping. So by adding a concrete capping, this is going to provide an extra environment for added protection to prevent uh, more seawater splashing, also oxygen from getting to the sheet pile and all Plus it's also encasing our animals. In fact, our animals are now the atoms. Just like our jacking system. The atoms are now attached to the sheet pile and case in this way. Now essentially this is the outback. So we have our submerged zone being protected by the bulk of the aluminum anodes and our top portion here protected by the uh, by the activated uh, zinc anodes. So here's just some pictures of some of the aluminum bulk anodes that are welded or applied to the sheet pile wall. It's obviously hard to get these pictures. Um, it's hard enough to get pictures from a construction site, let alone a building. So you can just see the bulk aluminum anode here is just directly welded to the sheet pile wall of the zinc. On the right side, I'm sure everybody, there will be some people that may be familiar with this, with this type of an anode, but it's actually a magnesium anode. Magnesium anode installed in case in a coat. The magnesium anode is inside of this bag, is inside of this bag as well. This coat creates to keep the magnesium anode active. And one thing to note is that this type of an anode is used on the dry land side, the opposite side of the water, the dry land side of the sheet pile wall. So if you look here, there's a sheet pile wall or corrosion here, you can still get corrosion in soils so those or sorry within that sheet pile wall a lot of those soils are going to be corrosive and so you will have corrosion on the front side or the water side and the land side um, so putting in uh, the magnesium anodes on the back side is going to provide also an area of protection for that so now i'm just going to finish it off by going through a, a short timeline of uh, basically a history of these water protection jackets and so as mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation we had the mass concrete jackets to get the epoxy fill to the concrete um, so this is what they did years and years ago protection jackets were built when they were trying to condense the light from the pile obviously it didn't keep away from corrosion this was the problem behind it in the corrosion so then the uh product protection jacket so in 1990, the zinc mesh jacket, so the tidal zone protection was invented. That's that zinc mesh uh, installed in the fiber platform, designed to protect this tidal zone area. And uh, I 
again, it was developed in the early 90s and it's for that idle zone. So, uh, so in 1999, there's probably a number of Remember the alpha biocracy green animals. So the original one was called the XB and it consisted of the same core and was activated based around the same core. So again, just like some of those activated jackals, this activates the same core. Activates it from inside the same and So to prevent that fast acceleration of brain animals and activities. The animal in your pair, what it does is it provides the automatic current and stops the second perimeter of this pattern. So, so from the alpha I activated it. Activated animals. This moved into the activated jackets. It was kind of a natural transition. Essentially, what we were doing was you're taking a small anode and making it much larger and placing it inside of a stay in place jacket. Uh, here on the right side, this was the project where we exposed the back wetting of the, of the columns, but we placed the activated anodes in there, jackets placed around it. And this is where this technology came from. It came from small discrete animals that were developed for this purpose. So it's the same technology being used um, as the small discrete animals. So, and then finally in 2015, um, you know, we realized that there needed to be some improvements to the original to the original uh, zinc mesh jacket. So that's when the tidal jacket or the tidal plus jacket. And again, it's just uh, relying on the reaction and uh, of the of the fabric here. So you get a lot of wetting from the seawater, plus you also have that barrier to stop the seawater. Again, we're not just protecting the tidal zone, we're also Basically, that is the uh, uh, value of the presentation. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pass it over to Scott to finish it up. Thanks, Jason. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. I know we had some audio problems throughout. Uh, we're working to resolve those, but we can take a few questions right now. Um, we might not have time to address them all, but uh, are you ready to go, Jay? I am, as long as you can hear me. Fantastic. Let me just uh, one thing here. So um, in what cases would you uh, use the modular forming system versus a fiberglass system? Um, so the fiberglass system is primarily used with the mesh jacket system. Um, that mesh jacket system is the mesh is, is pre-attached to the fiberglass um, stay in place forms. Um, if you're going to be using any of the uh, uh, the discrete at, or sorry, the uh, distributed anodes, the uh, the the uh, wicking anodes, the tidal plus, or the distributed anode system. That's where you're going to go to more of a of a modular system, or especially in an area where you maybe don't, you're not able to go in and field verify on um, the sizes of the jackets. Um, if you're unsure completely of the lengths or even the diameter that your jacket may be, it may be beneficial to use a modular one. Um, for example, you may turn some of these jackets into a structural jacket, so a structural repair where you're adding an additional cage of reinforcement. So if you're going to add an additional cage of reinforcement, you're going to increase the size of your jacket. So if you've already ordered had a fiberglass jacket manufactured for this process, you're going to have to go back and get another one made. Whereas with the modular system, you can just increase the size of it um, on site. Awesome. A uh, bunch of new questions just came in here. Um, uh, let's see here. 
Uh, can a polymer modified grout be used to fill the space, the annular space between the, the jacket and the concrete? Will that work? So typically we don't, you know, we don't want you to use a polymer modified material um, within the jacket system. We just want you to use a standard cementitious grout. Um, we want something that's a uh, uh, um, lower resistivity um, to be inside of the, uh, to be used as a grout. So if you look at Ohm's law, you know, E equals uh, I, I, R, um, we're wanting the resistance to be lower. The lower the resistance, the more current we're able to pass out of our jacket systems. Fantastic. Um, do you have any suggestions for, are these solutions applicable for freshwater um, environments as well? So there, some of these systems are applicable for fresh water. Um, you got to remember that again, for zinc, it needs to be activated either using the seawater or salt water. If you do not have that, so in a fresh water environment where you may have some sort of organic corrosion, um, or you may have some sort of uh, uh, other minerals or so forth in the water, what you can use is the activated, the, the uh, DAS or the activated jacket system in the fresh water location. Gotcha. Okay. So different environments matter. Um, what's, in your view, what's the most common mistake that contractors typically make when installing uh, these uh, these pile jackets? Um, that's probably, there's a lot of mistakes, I would say, that sometimes it's being used. I would say um, the, the, the most detrimental one is not checking the continuity and doing proper continuity corrections. Um, if a contractor isn't doing proper electrical connections, then the system isn't actually going to be connected and not functioning. Um, that's probably the biggest mistake. Um, so as long, so typically what ends up happening in that is there's some sort of an inspection that's required. Um, a cathodic protection specialist is going to be in or a technician that's going to be in to field verify to make sure that the contractors made the proper connections. Okay, uh, we have a flurry of questions coming here, but I, I'm cognizant of the time. So uh, just just time for one more. Um, this was an interesting one. Uh, I thought it might be a curveball for you. Uh, how do you protect bulk anodes or bulk aluminum anodes from uh, from on, on say a sheet pile from theft? Have you ever seen this? <laughs> I've only ever seen them stolen on site, not once they're actually installed under the water. <laughs> so. Um, Again, I've never I've never come across that that problem where they're stealing them. Um, the only you know, it's just on site where for storage. So I've never seen it under the water because typically you don't even know that there's animals under the water. They can't see them. Awesome. OK, um, thanks so much, Jason. Um, again, uh, I apologize here that we won't be able to get to every question today. Uh, there was a bunch that came in just at the end here. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to, to Jason uh, directly, though, um, if you have questions. He's happy to happy to speak with you. And um, again, apologies for the, the audio issues. We have another webinar this afternoon that we will clear those issues up and that will likely be the recording we post on the on the website. So we'll take care of that. Thank you, Jason, for joining us for Webinar Wednesday and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, uh, with everyone here today. Uh, on behalf of the Concrete Preservation Alliance uh, and everyone uh, in attendance, uh, thank you very much. For those of you who have not joined uh, the Webinar Wednesday program before, uh, the, Web the Concrete Preservation Alliance is authorized to offer one hour of NCSCA professional development credit for today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who are interested in receiving a certificate, you'll have to complete a very brief post presentation evaluation. Um, and a link uh, to, the, to the evaluation will be posted in the questions uh, function right now. Uh, in, and you also receive a, a post event email with the link uh, that should be in your inboxes very shortly. Um, or if you're uh, tech savvy, you can use the QR code on the screen uh, and it'll be taken you to take you to the forum uh, immediately right now. So just a reminder that today's uh, uh, recording will be up on the Concrete Preservation Alliance website, the We Save Structures website under the events menu uh, very shortly, and we'll clean up that audio as I mentioned. Uh, next up in the program is uh, targeted proactive corrosion protection uh, for bridges with embedded galvanic anodes with <coughs> Simpson on Wednesday, December 9th, followed by the evaluation and protection of bonded post-tension tendons with Mr. David Whitmore uh, on um, in January. Double the Davids, double the fun. We hope to join us for both. 
uh, you can receive register for these or any upcoming events at wesavestructures.info. This brings us to the end of today's program. Thank you for spending your uh, your time with us today. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, it's morning, evening, uh, or afternoon. We sincerely appreciate your decision to join us today, and we hope that you'll join us in saving structures tomorrow and in the future. Be safe out there, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.